Welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. Today we're going to look at some common tasks of gardening, spring gardening specifically because it's spring, but it's the things that we have to do that sometimes we don't want to do. All right, when we garden, uh, the fun part is sowing our seeds and watching our plants come up. And uh, yeah, about that time when the excitement is uh, fulfilled and you see our seedlings come up and things are growing, well, that's when the work starts. That's when the weeds show up and there's a lot of things we've got to do. So most of this we do, most of this you, you, you already do, but for the sake of maybe new gardeners or maybe just it doesn't cross your mind that these are things you should do, now let's go through a list of things that are the tasks we have to do, the work stuff. All right, the very first basic task in the garden is watering. Once you plant your plants, everyone knows you got to water them. But what point I want to make today is that watering should be consistent. Let me show you what I mean. Look at these poor borage plants. They look like they need water. But it's the height of the sun, the sun's beating down on them, and they have pumped all the water from their leaves down into the roots and stems as a defense mechanism so they don't vent off and aspirate a lot of water out of their leaves. They're looking sad. Lots of plants will do this, but if I dig down in the soil, there's moisture down there. And this is how you know if you're watering consistently. If you're watering consistently, your soil should hold a little bit of moisture. You should be able to stick your finger down in there two or three inches, maybe even four inches down, and you should feel that the soil is not dry. It's damp. Again, height of noon. All my plants are a little weepy. These beans over here are looking terribly bad. But that's natural, and that's okay. They'll perk up as soon as the sun is off of them. Again, you want to water consistently. That's the key. Consistent watering, not reactive watering. When you see your plants looking like that and you go and you water them, and every time you see it that way, you water them again, you may be overwatering. So consistency is the key, and don't be alarmed when your plants droop. Now, your plants may droop because the soil is dry. That's how you know. You go and test the soil with your finger. You stick your finger down in the soil, you dig around there, and you go about two or three inches down, and you need to feel some sort of a moisture in there. It doesn't need to be sopping wet. You don't want, you know, mud, but you don't want dry sand, dry, you know, soil, crumbly soil. It needs to be slightly damp down there. And when you can achieve that by regular watering, then you're watering correctly. But that's the key, consistently. I water every day if I need to, but always check first with your finger. The next question has to do with how to get the water to your garden. You know, the old time-tested uh, municipal water hose from your water supply. Well, that's pretty efficient. It's more efficient than this. But there's a place for both of them in my garden. Um, municipal water contains chemicals. It contains chlorine is the, is the big bad guy. Um, and so that can, you know, hurt your plants a little bit. But I've been using this for years, and many gardeners do. And uh, though it's not ideal uh, until I have my rain catchment system installed, uh, this is what I use. I use city water. <clears throat> if you're concerned about it and you don't have a rain catchment system, fill up your watering can and use it the next day. That'll give time for that watering can to vent off and evaporate some of those chemicals. Chlorine will evaporate out of that water pretty soon, pretty quick. But there are more efficient ways. If you've got a large garden and you want to garden consistently, then you could put in some sort of irrigation system. I have a drip irrigation system on my tomatoes and that gets the water uh, where it needs to be without me having to do any work. There's another tip about watering. Um, when we water, we're not watering the plants, so to speak. We're watering the soil. That's what we want to do. We want to keep our water off our plants in, in most cases. Um, plants can take up some water through their leaves, but it's inefficient because you're putting water on the leaves and that water is mostly just evaporating away rather than being down in the soil where the roots can get that water. That's the efficient way. So always try to water the soil and uh, not your leaves and foliage. There's another reason, and that is that if the water sits on the leaves, on the foliage, especially with these tomatoes right here, uh, that can encourage diseases, blight, uh, fungal diseases, things like that. You don't want that. So always try to water the soil, and that's why I've got my irrigation system on these tomatoes set up. They water the soil. There's also a debate as to when is the best time to water your plants. Um, during the height of the day, when it's hot outside like this, if I'm watering my garden, most of my water is going to be evaporating away because the soil's hot, um, 
and it's just not efficient. It's not going to get soaked down and percolate into the soil where my plants can use that, that water. So I like to recommend watering um, in the early, early part of the day, like when you get up, get your coffee, come out, water your garden. Um, but I often don't do that. Um, watering in the evening is also acceptable. Probably not quite as good as watering during the early part of the day, um, but it works, you know, late afternoon when the sun's not burning down on your garden. Uh, it's best to do that because that water then has time, the ground is cooler, it has time to percolate down and not evaporate away. Now I had somebody ask me just today to explain what I mean when I say there's a difference between uh, container gardening and in-ground gardening or raised bed gardening. And part of that has to do with watering. So when we plant in containers, uh, we use a potting mix. And a potting mix is usually heavy on peat, um, forestry products, you know, things that retain like a sponge, they retain moisture uh, enough to get your plants uh, you know, hydrated. But they also drain well. And because they're porous and because they're light and fluffy materials, uh, and because that pot is a smaller sample of soil that's not insulated by the ground all around it, a lot of evaporation can occur and your pot, potted plants dry out much quicker. So you have to be a little bit more diligent with your watering on your potted plants. And so there's a difference there. The plants in the ground can tolerate a lot more fluctuation in watering. Although we're looking for consistency, they can tolerate it better because there's more soil that they can go in. The roots can spread out further. In a container, they're bound up in that one small sample of soil. But in the garden beds, those roots can go out underneath the garden, out into the pathways, down into the subsoil beneath, and they can, they can harvest all that water that's down there. Mulch is always a good idea. It has to do with, well, there's numerous reasons why you should mulch your garden. But one of them has to do with it helps to retain the moisture that you put in the garden. Now, when you have a mulch, you want to have a loose mulch. This is oak leaves and, and uh, grass clippings. Most of the grass clippings are rotted away, but that's a good mulch because the water can penetrate that mulch and get to the soil. Then that mulch acts almost as a blanket. It insulates the soil beneath so it doesn't heat up so much. It um, keeps the moisture in. So if you're going to water your garden consistently, and you want, to make, you want to keep most of that moisture in there, mulch is a good practice. The next task we have to consider almost immediately when you start a garden is you have to weed the garden. Now, I let some weeds go here and there. It doesn't bother me if I've got a few weeds in the garden. I'm not a perfectionist and I don't think you should be either. But you do have to stay on top of the weeds. Again, consistent weeding is the key. Watering consistently, weeding consistently, and you'll stay ahead of the weed pressure. You see, weeds are sturdy plants, and they're, they're wild plants. They've not been uh, bred, and there's not cultivars made of like these tomatoes. These tomatoes are kind of pansies when it comes to it growing. You've got to baby them. They're susceptible to all kinds of diseases. Weeds aren't like that. Weeds are tough, and they will get in there and take over your nice garden soil and will compete with your plants if you let them get too, you know, too numerous. And so just staying ahead of the weave, weed pressure is all that's really needed. But that's one of the things we often fail to do, especially if it's hot outside like today. You don't want to go out and weed in the garden, you know. So go out in the mornings when you're watering your garden, just pluck the weeds as you go. Weeding is necessary. It's absolutely something that you, you can fail to do and all of a sudden you've got your, your garden overtaken by nut sedge or, or chickweed or something. Yeah, just stay on top of the weeds. Right here is a circumstance where if I don't get these weeds out of these holes here, they can grow over into my bed itself. This nut sedge has a deep root system that sends rhizomes out. And you can see that little nut sedge is probably connected to this little cluster. They tend to grow like that. I like to break them out. Now there's a nut down in there. It's going to send up another one. And uh, I'll just have to keep pulling that guy. But weeding, if you stay on top of your weeds and just pluck them out, uh, it won't get out of control for you. So every time I walk through my garden, I'm on the lookout for weeds. You can see I've pulled this nut sedge. It's anchored well in there. I've pulled that one. You can see where it's broken off. It's grown about an inch since I last saw that guy. If you haven't mulched your garden, one of the ways I like to weed is to use a stirrup hoe and it just glides under the surface of the soil and cuts those weeds down. 
And I just leave the, the weeds on the surface if it's sunny outside. Sun will desiccate them and they'll die. That purslane has a chance to come back because it's just succulent and it grows like crazy. But I'm just going to leave it there. And it's really easy with these, these uh, stirrup hose to cover a lot of ground. And as I stir that soil up, I can see that it's moist about an inch deep. That's good. So all kinds of ways to weed make life easier for you so you're not bending down all the time. That's one of the reasons that this bed does not have mulch over here yet. I can weed it. So those first two tasks, kind of obvious, right? If you're into gardening at all, you know you've got to water your plants and you've got to weed your plants. But the key to successfully doing those is consistency. Watering consistently, weeding consistently, that will improve your gardening success. All right, what's next? Let's talk about fertilizing. Fertilizing your garden um, is a tricky subject. It really depends on the style of gardening that you're, you're practicing. For example, container gardening, you almost always are gonna to have to fertilize in a container because the plant only has limited space to forage for resources and quickly uses up the nutrition in that little sample of soil. So fertilizing on a regular schedule, again, here's where consistency once again comes into play. Um, I like to fertilize every two weeks and I'll fertilize with maybe a half strength or a three fourth strength uh, liquid fertilizer every two weeks on all my container plants. I also fertilize my in-bed plants uh, with fish emulsion or with a particular uh, targeted fertilizer like a tomato fertilizer for these tomatoes because it's got, uh, at this time, I want that, those tomato plants to put on lots of blooms. And so I'm going to need uh, less nitrogen and more phosphorus and potassium. So you know, read your ratio and see in the early seasons of your plants where you're trying to develop leaves and foliage, lots of nitrogen is helpful. So I use fish emulsion for that. And I switch to something when the blooms are setting that has lower nitrogen and higher potassium and phosphate. But you don't have to always fertilize like that. You can do what I've done in the past. And I've depended solely on the compost layer that I put on my garden. Compost breaks down and feeds your soil. And over the years, you develop real healthy, real rich soil with lots of nutrition in it. And like Charles Dowding in the UK says, you get a whole year, a whole, whole year out of one layer of compost. That's two or three growing seasons and your garden is still fertile. Well, um, that's true unless you have heavy feeders, unless you have um, compromised compost, it's not as rich as, as it could be. Uh, I like to come back in with fish emulsion and help my plants get a boost. I like to come back with some liquid fertilizers every now and then. With these tomatoes, I'm doing every two weeks, like I said, because I'm trying to see if I can apply commercial greenhouse practices on these tomatoes um, in this bed this year and see the difference of regular fertilizing and when I didn't fertilize regularly. So fertilizer, you need some fertilizer in container plants. It's optional in your raised beds if you have good healthy soil. There is a debate over what kind of fertilizers you should use. Um, I use this Neptune's Harvest. You can see it's a 242. It's got that higher phosphorus number in the middle there. Uh, low nitrogen, high phosphorus. This is, uh, helps the blooming and root development. And that's what I want with those tomatoes right now. They're putting on lots of fruit, I have lots of blooms, and I want them to fruit heavily. This is an organic fertilizer, and it comes with all kinds of wonderful stuff in it. Um, it's based on a fish emulsion. I like fish emulsion. Fish emulsion is just a byproduct of the fishing industry and good stuff for your garden. Some people like chemistry. And they'll buy something like this uh, Jack's Classic Blossom Booster. It's a 10, 30, 20. Again, there's that high number in the middle. Uh, I would start, for example, if I was going to use this, I would start my plants out when they're young with fish emulsion, which is a 5-1-1. That high nitrogen helps them get developed early, greens them up. And if your plants are ever looking yellow um, or not quite as green as you think they should be, fish emulsion is low dose enough where it's, it's never a bad time to use that. But this stuff, when the blossoms start coming on, I use this with some of my trees uh, in pots. And it is a chemical, and it's got that bright blue powder in there like miracle Grow. And uh, yeah, well, it's, just, it's just pure chemicals. The, the downside to this is if you use it for, um, for a very long time, you're going to be lacking some of the micronutrients that your plants need. And uh, there is some question about whether you're depleting your soil over time. Uh, so I don't use this in my beds. I only use it in um, my potted plants, my pot potted trees. And I find that it works just fine. Nutrition is nutrition. 
a molecule uh, derived in a laboratory or a factory line is uh, of nitrogen is the same molecule of nitrogen that is grown in a fish or naturally organic. It's the same molecules. Your plants don't know the difference. So uh, choose wisely. If you use a synthetic fertilizer that has such a high dose, back off a little bit if you're concerned about those high numbers. And whatever you do, don't let anyone shame you for not being organic. There's nothing wrong with this stuff. A little weird colored. That blue can be alarming, but it smells, it smells like nutrition. So let's go put this on some plants. Now again, I just used this particular fertilizer on my fig trees and my potted plants. Um, I find that it does quite well. And when you fertilize, just replace a normal watering with the fertilizer and that'll serve you well. And again, I'll do this every two weeks. Some of these liquid fertilizers can be absorbed by the plant through the leaves. That's called a foliar feed. And so these figs are getting a nice drink of this stuff and will respond by greening up a little more. But if I don't fertilize these, that soil in these pots is two or three years old. And this plant has already depleted all these nutrients that were in here, along with the weeds that are down in there. So got to fertilize. And again, consistency. Get your calendar, get on Google Calendar and make yourself some reminders and don't skip out on it. Your plants are dependent on you in these pots for their nutrition. We move on to another task that has to be done in the garden. It's a basic gardening task, but we're moving away from more obvious tasks like watering and weeding. We're, we're moving closer to some more specialized tasks that have to do with the kind of plants you're growing. You gotta prune your plants if you want your plants to grow in the best growth form or uh, growing habit that uh, the plant is capable of. These tomatoes, um, I prune them once a week and I come in and uh, look for parts that need pruning, take out the suckers and train them up this string. I have a whole video on this tomato pruning method um, that you can go and watch, but you gotta prune your plants if you want them to grow to their maximum p potential. So that's something that we want to continue to learn about for each of the kinds of plants we grow. Uh, how to prune that plant, just get on YouTube. Um, I've got lots of pruning videos on pruning tomatoes, pruning peppers, that kind of thing. Most plants benefit from some type of pruning. Pruning is a very broad topic, but basically pruning means removing parts of the plant to encourage growth in other parts of the plant. Take these uh, muscadine vines, for example, every year. These things grow so lush and they get all the way almost down to the ground and they grow many, many feet. But every year I prune them back to these little growing stubs here. And that is so that I can increase my production. I can train the plant to grow the way I want it to grow. And you can see they come back every year. When you prune a plant um, or top a plant, you're redirecting the growth of that plant, the hormones in that plant, the auxins that make the plant grow. Uh, there's all kinds of pruning lessons out there, but you've got to learn how to prune. Take the time and figure out which plant I'm going to work on this, this season or this growing season or which group of plants am I going to study and learn how to prune. That's a basic gardening task that you need to learn how to do. The next basic thing that gardeners need to learn uh, is thinning their plants. Now, a lot of gardeners freak out when they have to come in here and thin their plants. Thinning means we're taking out some of the density here. When I planted these cucumber plants, who are looking a little droopy in the heat of the sun, but they'll perk up. But when I planted them, I planted them thickly so that I would be sure I had plenty of plants to choose from. And I understood when I planted those densely that I was going to have to sacrifice some of these and thin them. Well, that's what I'm going to have to do. It's time to come in and thin. I'm going to leave about four plants to go up this trellis. So I'm going to select the ones that look the healthiest and the others. I'm just going to snip them down at the base and their roots will compost in place there. You see what I'm doing is selecting the, the healthiest looking plants that are spaced about right where I need them. Yeah. See it's hard because now look what we've got. We've got just a few plants and they look kind of pitiful. But what we're doing is clearing up this area so that these plants will have good airflow. 
Uh, their root systems will not be competing with their neighbor so closely, like that guy. They're a little bit spread out. We will also have to prune and train these cucumbers up this trellis. Um, as well, you know, we're thinning, but then we're going to prune and trellis these guys, and I'll show you how to do that in a separate video. But let me finish thinning this garden. There we go. We'll see what happens here. Those guys have a lot more room to grow now. The next basic gardening task that we have to do as gardeners, uh, not always, but with some kinds of plants, it's almost mandatory, is to trellis them, to support them somehow, to bring them up off the ground and support the weight of the plants as they grow. This is beneficial in a number of ways. Uh, for one, it gives you more space to grow in. You can grow squash, any kind of vining plant, beans, Anything that'll climb, you can grow those up a trellis and keep your fruit off the ground and keep it easier to water your plants at the soil level. Um, keeps good airflow through the plants and, well, you can harvest right here. So trellising, it's a basic gardening task. There are many ways to trellis. I'll show you a couple of mine. Here is a trellising system, a system that I've explained in other videos. And you can see the string comes down. And there are clips in there holding the, the single vine to this trellis system. This is one way of trellising, but those tomatoes most definitely need support. Other plants that need support can grow on other things. Again, the beans are looking sad because it's the heat of the day, but they'll perk up. But notice they're climbing on this net trellis that I've made. Showed you how to do that. The cucumbers that we just thinned we will be supporting them vertically on a net trellis and that's basically the same way that you uh, you can grow anything vertically with a net trellis uh, net trellises are handy because they're cheap and easy and we will grow those cu cu cucumbers vertically uh, you could let them sprawl but i like to grow them up and down as support here's a method that most most gardeners are familiar with the uh, tomato cage tomato cages are useful for these determinate style tomatoes that are bush types and basically all the cage does is support the branches when they fruit. I don't like to use tomato cages for indeterminate types anymore. The kind that vine and will grow forever like those over there. That's why I'm trying that new system this year that from all my research this is the absolute best way to trellis indeterminate tomatoes. The classic steak. This is one way to keep a young tree with a thin trunk from whipping around is tie it to a stake. That's one of the basic tasks we as gardeners need to learn is how to support our plants. The next task that we as gardeners need to do consistently, and I, I hope you're recognizing the theme here of consistency. Consistency is the overarching message of this video. But the next task is that we should consistently inspect our garden for pests and diseases. I'm walking around during the heat of the day, as I've said a dozen times, but you can see how the plants are wilty. You need to also uh, realize that that is not a pest or disease pressure. But these plants do sort of lay down so that you can get in here and look around and see if you can find any kind of pest or disease or signs of insect eggs. You want to look on the undersides of all the leaves and look around. For guys like that there's oh there's a perfect example who just flew away that was a cucumber beetle and we want to keep that guy out of the garden that's the first cucumber beetle I've seen but there he was I wouldn't have seen him if we weren't looking for him I have seen many vine borer moths squash vine borer moths so there's certainly eggs around here but I have not found any of the eggs I have literally seen them laying eggs on these so and I was able to get one I was able to squash one the other day but inspect your plants, look for diseases, anything out of the ordinary, and make sure that, well, it's not just wind damage or, or uh, sun damage, but check and see if you've got pests. Got him. That, that's a spotted cucumber beetle. He won't be making it out alive. Now, usually when I see pests like those beetles in the garden, I just try to hand pick them. If they get way out of control, then we got to bring in some sort of a, a insecticide. I try to stick with organic insecticides, but sometimes you got to bring out the big guns. But uh, we'll see how this looks 
this is a new development with those cucumber beetles and uh, yeah they're not good for the garden with your tomato plants you want to go through and inspect the leaves for uh, fungal blights and diseases spots yellowing and if you see anything that looks like it's compromised just cut it off just remove it and don't compa don't compost those leaves uh, you might be uh, compounding your problems in the future but just inspect your plants and hang out in your garden for a while look for any kind of chewing we've got something chewing on these leaves a lot of times this chewing is caterpillars and so what we'll do is come out at night with a black light and see if we can't find tomato hornworms out here because they're often a culprit but uh, yeah the chewing insects can be dealt with usually with neem oil sprayed on your plants uh, in solution with water or BT which is a bacterial insecticide natural derived insecticide and any chewing type insects can usually be knocked back with that kind of a treatment you want to look for snail and slug damage those are usually round circular holes and usually on the lower portions of your plant and uh, as you inspect if you see any snail and slug damage usually on your more tender greens then you can use an iron phosphate pellet again sounds chemical but it's uh, perfectly natural it doesn't harm anything but the slugs and the snails will be reduced by that yeah we've got some pest pressure right here you can see that looks like some something's been eating on this leaf when you see something like this look on the bottom side and look very closely for things like spider mites little tiny red or black specks that are moving around there this just looks like old old caterpillar damage that's been scarred up again with your pest and disease inspections make it a consistent thing go along with your weeding um, with your pass through your garden for weeding and also keep an eye out for your pests and be familiar with what's going on here's what happened to me a couple years ago I got some spider mites in my perpetual spinach and I didn't notice them because I hadn't been going out and looking at that perpetual spinach uh, very frequently because it, well it was doing great it was thriving it was hot outside when it's hot you're less inclined to go out in your garden but when I went out there and found these uh, spider webby looking things on the undersides of those leaves I thought oh, I'll, I'll treat those with some neem oil in a day or two well in a day or two they had already spread into my cucumbers into my squash and decimated so many of my plants that year I wasn't able to to get a good harvest so consistency be consistent with inspecting your garden well, there it is some simple tasks some of them are pretty obvious but i hope that you've seen that throughout all these tasks the thing that we're going for is consistency work yourself on a schedule get yourself on a regular schedule of watering weeding fertilizing inspecting um, all the things you got to do in your garden do them on a consistent regular basis you'll stay ahead of the weeds you'll stay a little bit ahead of the pest pressure you'll stay ahead of the weather in some senses be a better gardener. Hey, I hope this has been helpful. If it is, please share our videos, like, and subscribe. We'll talk to you next time. Happy gardening.